Flash, welcome to 10% True. Thanks for joining us on the channel. Thank you. So Flash, we're uh, effectively today recording what is part four, I think, of my Wild Weasel series. So you are a hugely experienced F-16 pilot. You're going to talk us through in a minute a short introduction as to your career and your Air Force history. But the objective today for anybody who's listening is to talk about your experiences flying the F-16 CJ as a wild weasel. You did that in uh, a variety of theaters, including Iraq and northern Iraq, and then in, in the Balkans in the late 1990s. And so if anybody listening hasn't already caught parts one, two, and three of the Wild Weasel series, then please catch up on that before you come to this, because some of the things we'll be talking about today will make sense, um, will make more sense if you've done that. And finally, just so I don't have to record an intro, uh, as usual, I'll just remind everybody at home that the podcast is free. I don't monetize it. I don't make any money out of it. If you want to support me, you can buy me a coffee. Uh, That's a link in the description of this video. But the best way you can support me is to get Flash's story out to as wide an audience as possible. So share it, like it, uh, leave a comment. I don't know if Flash is going to be able to come and answer questions in the comment section of this video. We'll see. But if you've got any questions for him, you're welcome to do that. Or you can come and join us in our Discord channel, the description for which is also going to be in, uh, the link for which will also be in the description. Um, and you can come and interact with us there. So, with that said, my intro done. Uh, Flash, tell us who are you and what's your background? Yeah, Ryan Barker, uh, Bellside Flash. Um, I started uh, flying Vipers in 90, let's see, I guess it was uh, 96, and uh, retired from the Air National Guard in uh, 2016, the beginning of 2016. So, all told, I was in the Air Force about 22 years, all in F-16s, um, pretty much all blocks from the 25 through the 52, and uh, wound up uh, doing the first half of my career in active duty at uh, Kunsan Shah, uh, Osan, and Cannon, and then went to the Alabama Air National Guard in Montgomery, and that's where I was for the last half of my career until I retired. And you went to weapons school as well. You, you're a weapons school graduate. I did. Um, so, uh, so. It was uh, 07, 07 Alpha. So, so what was the first version of the F-16 that you flew then operationally, uh, not not B course, but operational? The Block Thirty uh, at Kunta. Okay, and and that so that's an air to ground sort of general air to ground rather than specialist in in wild weasel or specialist night attack like the Block Forty. Yeah, it was uh, the the way we operated it in Korea. Uh, it was general purpose bombs, um, some air to air, and then we actually uh, we called it dumb harm. Uh, so we were part of the game plan to try to suppress the the North Koreans' air defense with uh, just shooting preemptive harm shots. Did you do any, as, as part of that, did you do any Wild Weasel light course or, or were you simply learning how to point the airplane in the right direction and unleash the weapon? Only only to the extent of, you know, what what uh, we needed to know about the missile itself, which there, there wasn't, there wasn't much that, uh, that we could do with that, that airplane and the, the architecture. Um, so there was, it, it was a really a lot more figuring out the avionics uh, to to have the weapon set up properly. And that was a two, two-year tour or three years? That was what? Was that a two-year tour or a three-year tour? That was uh, one year. One year, okay. Of course, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so your introduction to the F-16 CJ then, the Wild Weasel version of the F-16, was, was when? That was uh, following that, that first tour at Kunsan. I went to Shaw. Uh, summer of '97, and uh, and then I, you know, I was there for three and a half years. Can you talk a little bit about the um, maturity or the you know the the sort of unclassified at least capabilities of the F-16 CJ when you arrived at that point in time? And we, we've got in in our previous episodes, we talked a little bit about the Air Force retiring the F-4G. Uh, you know, there right. was during. Um, 
Desert Storm, there was this hunter killer team of F4Gs and F16s, were primarily sounds like, as you described there, were Kunsan, they're just harm shooters rather than a wild weasel capability. But over time, of course, the Air Force right. replaced the F4G. What was the airplane like when you arrived at that point in time? Then? It was, uh, you know, we were still, we were still developing tactics, you know, for the, for the seed mission. Um, and, uh, one of the, one of the big pushes that, that we, we made as a, uh, as a community, I, I guess, as the CJ community was force protection. So it was not just the, the, uh, air to surface, it was the air to air. Uh, so we were between us, um, Masawa, Mountain Home, uh, McIntyre Guard guys, uh, Spang Dalem. You know, we we all collectively were coming up with new tactics and and ways to be in the right position at the right time to support strike packages. Um, and what we found too was after various deployments, either operationally or you know exercises, we might find that. Masawa, for instance, was doing something that, you know, we thought, hey, that that makes a lot of sense. You know, what how'd you all come up with that? You know, what what drove you to that? You know, and, and we'd sit down and talk, or, you know, we might see somebody that was doing something where we thought, that makes no sense. What you know, what are you guys doing? And try to figure out maybe what we were missing. But when I got there, the 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 bottom line is we were still trying to sort of uh, come up with standard tactics and and there were still questions and um we we had a, a pretty good 90 percent solution but uh, there was certainly room for improvement and and as i saw later on when i went back to uh when i went to weapon school um they had really matured and come up with some pretty good answers to uh to questions that we had had back when i was first in the airplane I suppose the obvious question that I would ask then is understanding, of course, or recognizing that force protection is, is different from being a pure, let's say, wild weasel platform because you're operating in the air-to-air -air environment as well. But from, from an air-to-ground perspective, would you not have just picked up the F4G playbook um, and started with that as a starting point? Would that have, did that happen or is that a ridiculous suggestion? I'm sure, I'm sure it did. Uh, especially with those first guys at Spang that were that were working in those hunter killer teams, but you know our our bear, if you will, was the HTS pod. So while they had you know a different system, obviously there in the in the F4G and a guy to run it, interpret it, you know, help tell the pilot where to go, what you know, what direction to to aim and I don't know who the who the shooter was if it was the front seater or the back seater but the bottom line is um you know you had one guy dedicated in in that jet to to interpreting signals you know putting the uh, the right information uh into and I'm I'm making this up because I don't know the the F4G systems but putting it into the box if you will and making sure that uh the missile was doing what they wanted to do uh where for us the HTS pod was providing that for the most part. Mm. So we had to come up with the ways to work together as a formation um, with that data, whatever data it was providing, communicate it, react appropriately. Did you have so definitely a different setup system wise? Did, did you have any um, F4G influence in, in your unit when you arrived at it then? Were there any old F4G drivers? Did you, and, and were you hiring EWOs? I mean, I know I, I went to Spang in 2004 and they had Intel guys who would fly, would fly with them. Um, so they understood the systems and, and the capabilities of the aeroplane. But did you have EWOs who come along as advisors? Was there an influence? Uh, we, You know, we had guys who had EWO experience, um, who like our wing ECPs who had, who had gone and sat down with, F4G guys. In fact, in Korea, we had an F4G guy was our wing ECP. Um, and he was awesome. He, you know, and like I say, it was dumb harm, but when we were flying the, the two seater, uh, regardless of what the type of mission was, but particularly on a uh, harm mission or an air to air mission, you know, he'd sit in the back and 
write down notes and be ready to make call outs. And so part of our debrief would be, you know, Hey, what, you know, what, what did you see here? What was different? What could have, what may have uh, changed with this airplane versus what you used to fly. And so we, we got some good essay from him. Um, and at least at Shaw, we didn't, that I recall, we didn't have anybody that was a F4G guy, you know, that we could talk to directly. So it was just things that were lesson learned, lessons learned from the past, or like I say, guys that had uh, sat down with those guys and tried to help come up with the F-16 playbook. You said just now that the harm targeting pod, HTS harm targeting system, I think is the formal name for it, but that that was your bear. Can you tell us about that? Mm-hmm. What, what was what is it? Uh, it's a uh, a little sensor pod that goes on the uh, or at the time it went on the the right chin. I think it's interchangeable now, but uh, the bottom line is uh, it's just a, a sensor that could pick up the signals. Uh, you know, electronic signals out there of essentially whatever we programmed it to listen to. Um, so, you know, in a given theater, we would be looking for particular threats. And so that was what we used to try to find those threats and then subsequently have it displayed for us to be able to then target and shoot if if uh, it made sense for where we were, when we were in the in the push, where the strike package was, et cetera. There's always, I think, a, a, a debate around uh, machines doing the work of humans and, and vice versa. And, and when you talk to you know, guys going back, you know, let's say to Vietnam, and you talk about things like radar warning receivers, you know, today's and for many years, radar warning receivers have provided a synthetic picture based on what a, a computer thinks it's seeing versus those guys mm-hmm. who would have seen a raw strobe on a, on a scope and and the same is true i think with the uh, the hts so you know some of the old school ewos would prefer to be able to analyze a signal themselves rather than have a computer do it for them what was your as a single seat f16 guy then what was your interpretation of the performance of the hts were there areas where you could see it was deficient were you going to red flags and being able to you know against the threat emulators and the real threat systems at Toledo peak were you able to see it perform did you have confidence in it uh yeah we did there you know there were some uh there were there were certainly some areas where we uh for for a while and it was starting to mature uh fairly well by the time I got there, but there were, there were certainly some known areas where, um, you know, we, if, if you were given a, a particular threat displayed, you know, your confidence was, you know, maybe 50, 50 and another threat you might go, yeah, there's, it's a hundred percent. I know that's what I'm looking for. Um, and as we figured that out, you know, we got better and better at the at the programming piece, and uh, you know, to the to the point now where it's it's fairly fairly accurate system. You know, just in time to be replaced with the next gen. Did you, so? So it sounds like the important thing was that you knew where it was performant and where it wasn't, and provided that that was the case, you could work around it. Yep, yep, that was important. That was a big part of our mission planning and briefing can, can I ask them flash about this uh, I don't know if it's a mischaracterization to say it's dual role then but this force protection um, when so so if you're flying that mission what's your priority uh, I, I mean you know so so let's say you've got a SAM that's come up on your HTS but you can also see there's a, a, a MiG-29 or something what are you how do you prioritize how do you deal with that it would depend on where you are in the where you are and where the strikers are uh, in relation to the threat. So if if we as the the CJ guys were well out in front and you know we've figured out that there are no airborne bad guys, um, if a you know if a surface to air threat came up, we would just have a essentially a, a threat timeline, if you will, to go, okay, hey, I, I don't need to worry about that right now, or that is going to be a factor to the strikers, so I am going to shoot at it. And same thing applied with the air-to-air threat, uh, particularly if we're out in front, 
if we determine it's going to be a threat to us or the strikers, then that becomes a priority for somebody to target. Are there parts of that where doing something that's advantageous to shooting down another airplane is actually disadvantageous to taking out a SAM and vice versa, where if you're going to commit to one, you're probably going to screw yourself for the other? Potentially, and that's part of the... the, uh, part of where you're going to prioritize your, your sensors. And when I say you, I mean, as a, ideally a four ship. So if my element is prosecuting an air to air threat, then if let's say I'm targeting the air to air threat, then my wingman is, he's watching with his radar, but he's also ready to go to pick up an air to ground threat. Uh, if they're trying to, we, we call it a sandbush. I don't know if that's still how they, how they reference it, but try to draw us in using the bad guy to get us into those, those threat rings. Um, and if I have a four ship, the beauty of it is that I can work it so that I have another two jets that are, that are there ready to go with their harms and anything that's coming up to threaten us, they can obviously take a shot at realizing that the, the harm's never going to beat the SAM, but, you know, smart operators are probably not going to just sit there and leave their radars on. Mm -hmm. Did you have data link or anything like that at this time? We did. Yep. And, and how much there was uh, it was very basic and had some latency, but we did. Was, was it a game changer um, in, in the sense that it provided greater SA? Would it, would it be actually an an Uh, SA sync? Short answer is yes, because um, we could also now receive data from uh, the RJ, uh, which is one of the one of the missions that I had proved to be very effective, uh, and uh, was was uh, very nice to have. Particularly when let's say we we're just just crossing the border, just on the uh, initial push, leaving a strike package. Uh, if we had RJ on station, you know they could give us the the threat low down, you know, what they saw going into it, which may or may not have matched with what we had at takeoff. Mm. So that was, that was pretty huge. Let, let, let's talk about, um, deny flight. I'm sorry, ally, for, ally force then. So, um, throughout the 1990s, there's, um, you know, conflict in, in the Balkans. There's, you know, Slobodan Milosevic is persecuting the Kosovan Albanians, I think it was. And, you know, he's he's sort of a, a Serbian and, and there's all this stuff going on. And, and I think it got to something like 200,000, 250,000 people have been ethnically cleansed by the time um, Allied force happened in March of 1999. So where, what were you doing at that time? Which unit were you flying with? How much experience? So you said you got to shore in 97. Were you still at shore at that time then? So you had two or three I years was. in the jet? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, I had just finished my uh, upgrade to instructor pilot. Um, and when, when we, you know, when the, uh, the conflict for us as the U.S. Uh, first started, in other words, when, you know, we, we were, uh, I'll just say the conflict kicked off. We were all still there at Shaw. Nobody deployed. Uh, Spangdalem, Aviano, you know, they were they were the ones that were going downtown on night one, two, three, et cetera. Um, so for us, we were just running back and talking to the Intel guys every day to get the updates and see what was happening. And um, I can tell you that we were we got very focused and very uh, interested right away just because of the reports coming back that they were shooting back uh, with both the SAMs and AAA and they had, they were launching their jets and, you know, mm -hmm. guys were getting kills, you know, I think Dutch Viper, the, uh, the F-15 C guys, uh, you know, bottom line is it was a, uh, a, a real shooting will war, if you will, compared to what we've been doing for the last however many years with North and Northern and Southern watch. Can I take you back a little bit before it starts then? So mm -hmm. wh when did you know you were going to deploy uh, to Aviano and when did you um, 
What did what did you do in in terms of starting to build a, a battle plan? Um, were you were you involved in that process? Were you part of the mission planning cell? Or we didn't know uh, until after it started, and it essentially came down to the the political game plan of hey, we're just going to drop a, a few bombs, and Milosevic is just going to roll belly up and say, okay, I give. When they didn't happen in the prescribed time then that's when we started getting the, uh, and I'm oversimplifying, but the phone call saying, Hey, get ready. We're going to need you over there mm-hmm. because as we've learned however many times, the, the IADS was not targeted because we, we had this other game plan that, and this, this, uh, belief that Milosevic was just going to give up. So we, we hadn't, done anything to speak of with his air defense and so i think by day three or four we were we were being told hey get ready you know we're going to need you over there um so we had really done nothing other than standard training up until that point and then it was was very much force protection focused um and get ready to go and and us trying to just gather as much intel as we could of what are guys doing? What's working? What's not working? You know, what do we need to be ready for the second we arrive? Mm. So, so how much notice did you get then? So, so it's day two or three, um, because it, because it was phased. I think there were three, three or so phases, major phases for the, for the conflict. Did you have yeah, we much had, spin up time? Um, no, we, we had, uh, I think we showed up, we were wheels on the ground it was, I believe, two weeks after it had started. Hmm. So we had about a week and a half from the time that we heard, "Hey, you're you're going, or you're, at least you're probably going to where we've arrived." There was a um, an intel report that the uh, Air Force Historical Research Agency um, had declassified and released a while back. It said something like, um, from memory. 13 SA threes and 25 SA sixes. That was what the u.s thought the um core capability and the man pads and triple a is that does that tally with your memory of what the threat was in terms of system types and uh yeah i don't know what the numbers were but yeah threes and sixes for sure threes sixes and then their uh you know their their highest caliber triple a that i recall was 57 millimeter and that can reach higher certainly the man pads were a factor so, so what did you know of then the the caliber of the SAM operator? Did you know who, I mean, you obviously went to weapons school where I guess you sort of, you know, sort of you research these things and you understand systems and, and threat systems to the nth degree. But at that point in time, did you really know much about uh, who the Serbian SAM operator was, what their tactics were, what their level of training was, their capabilities? No, not not beyond that. They were Russian trained, you know, Russian trained, Russian equipment. That was that was essentially the the extent of our essay. Okay. Um, so that was one of the reasons that we were so interested uh, as soon as it kicked off. But even more so, once we found out we were we were going to be going on what particularly the other CJ guys, what the Spangdalen guys were were seeing and and what they were doing. So what did they say? You, you've, you've just referenced the facts that they were flying their MiGs um, and they were also shooting back. What, what specifically did this, the Span guys report? Uh, you know, to give it the, the broad brush approach, it was basically that they're moving, they're SAMs, they're not, they're not staying in one place, they're, they're being smart in that regard, uh, and they're not just turning on their radars and, and leaving them on. So... They were they were clearly uh, had CJs in mind or or had the SA themselves that they were going to be vulnerable if they stayed in one place and left their radars on. So it was clear that they were they were smart operators and understood at least some of our capability. Hmm. Were they talking about uh, terrain? Did the the because it was quite mountainous area and that presumably makes things much harder but was that a consideration Mm -hmm. as well it was particularly uh for the triple a and man pad piece of knowing where you were so that you know if they did 
set something up, um, you know, and increase their their uh, ability to reach up high to to get us. Um, that was something that we had to consider, particularly depending on where we were. Uh, you know, down south in Kosovo, vicinity of Pristina, you know, that was that was definitely a, a factor and certainly, um, you know, different areas up, up there in the central and north. But, yeah, that was that was a consideration. We had, uh, or I had Star Baby on, who was an F-15E wizard, who, who was flying who, XF-4G, flying the uh, F-15E at that time and going after some of the... Um, some of the SAM sites in, in that on that that aeroplane, but as I understand it, you know the, the Wild Weasel Force, let's say, was EA six B, F fifteen E, F sixteen CJ, Rivet Joint. You just men- mentioned um, there were Tornado ECRs, I think Italian and, and German ECRs carrying harm. Um, yeah. What 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 level of coordination or even uh, collaboration went on between all those different assets and, and you guys in the CJ world? Um. We primarily, as far as uh, the CJs go, you know, we were we were working with the RJs. Um, we were mainly deconflicting with the. Uh, well, that's not a. We would coordinate to some extent with the with the prowlers, um, but there was a lot of. We're just we're in a given sector. We're going to work here. You all are in another sector. You're going to work there. Um, and, uh, it, it was a lot more of a free for all compared to what we, I think we do a lot better job of these days. Um, as far as the, uh, cooperation, interoperability of, of different nations, different forces. Um, so there were, you know, there were some, some, uh, pretty, we worked it out, and the good news was with us in the Navy, you know, we had worked a lot with, with the uh, Prowlers, particularly in uh, Northern Watch and Southern Watch. And so we understood each other's capabilities to to a, actually a pretty good extent. When, you know, they would jam, when they would shoot, if they were even carrying, uh, which they did sometimes, sometimes they didn't. Um, you know, as far as the, uh, the ECRs, uh, we really didn't work with them at all that I recall. Uh, they just, they were in different areas or with a different strike package. Um, so it it was not, not wild, wild west, but, uh, there were certainly some times where (laughs) you just didn't, you know, Hey, who's doing what and where, um, you know, and, and part of this too, and I don't know how, how much you've heard or read, but, you know, we were, everybody was on a, open frequency so there was no secure com to speak of so what, it was a mess what were the implications to you about on that then what, what i mean what did, what does that stop you doing what does it prevent you from being able to achieve well it just lets anybody who's listening you know hear what's hear what's going on and and they you know they'd have to have some pretty good knowledge of of uh of our comms just to even interpret what what was happening but it, you know there it was clear they were pretty smart uh, already so you know there the assumptions would be you know you could you could uh, I, I am assuming and I don't know this but I assume that they were listening in and um, so that has its its uh, pros and cons mostly cons but uh you know you could if they were smart and listening and their you know their uh comms on the ground were good enough you know if if i was to say magnum and they understood what that meant you know that might get them to shut down their radars for instance mm-hmm. and the beauty of that is anybody could do it anybody could say it and maybe it works maybe it doesn't but uh that was that was just uh, one of the examples of, you know, hey, we're we're all in open comms here, so good luck. Try to keep the comm brevity. Try to stick with the three dash one. Um, you know, not so much plain English where they could just easily understand what's going on. Mm. 
And did you just say, Flash, did I hear you right? You said sometimes the, the Tornado ECRs were not carrying any weapons. No, sorry, the, the uh, Prowlers. The Prowlers, okay, yeah, because they, they had to carry fuel tanks instead of harms, right? Because they... Right, they the get their fuel pots. tanks and then they have their... Exactly, right. So they had to prioritize, depending on where they were, where they were coming from, you know, whether they could carry one harm, two harms, no harms, just, you know, it would depend. Yeah. Before I ask if you would just talk us through some of the missions that you flew um, or the memorable ones, the ones that stand out to you most, can I ask a little bit about the um, balance between destruction of enemy air defences and suppression of enemy air defences? Um, mm-hmm. th- this is, um, I'll be honest and say this is one of the few interviews I've actually done some research for. Normally I turn up and just chat but this one i felt like i probably ought to go away and look up some facts and figures because it's such a long time ago my memory of it is quite hazy but one of the figures that i read in uh, again the the historical research agency report was that i think it was something like 840 sa- um 840 harms i think something like that it was 800 plus harms were launched and the u.s claimed only three sa6s destroyed from from those and so you could look at that and say well that's you know that's a, a dramatic failure on, on behalf of mm. you know the harm and on behalf of the weasels uh, but if you talk to a weasel and you're going to tell me if i'm right on this they'll say actually that's not the metric you're looking for you're looking to understand how many um, aircraft are shot down and, and serbia is catalogued as having launched uh, about the same number of sams um, and only claimed two um, aircraft destroyed for it so what is the balance as a cj guy a wild weasel what's the balance between going and killing a site and suppressing it which which one is preferable which one matters do they both matter what's the philosophy yeah if if you could if you could destroy the a sam side if you could destroy the radar ideally and keep it that way then that's that's what everybody wants uh, at least on the good guy side um if all it does and i and i'm saying that um, fairly tongue-in-cheek, but if all it does is, and I say all it does, launching a harm gets them to turn the radar off and it prevents them from guiding a missile, you know, or acquiring to launch against us, then that's a success. I mean, that's, that's part of the point is even if we never launch, but they understand we have the capability to kill them, so they either don't illuminate us or turn it off before they can get into that terminal guidance phase, then that's a win for us. So it's a part of, um, and, and I'll, I'll tell you in a few minutes, you know, one of the, one of the uh, really good missions that we had uh, was integrating the uh, block 40 guys with us and finding a site and putting a harm on it and killing it with a bomb. Um, that's ideal, but that's, you know, that was a dedicated, uh, what wound up being a dedicated six jets, wow. which was stuff we should have been doing on night one and two, but that's old ground now. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing that. Let me, let me just as an extension of that, before you tell us the story, um, just ask then, I, I suppose you're putting your, your life on the line, going out and flying these missions each day, each night. Um, and you're, you know, your colleagues are doing the same thing. Do you have a burning desire to kill the site because it means you're not going to have to come back and deal with that same operator or that same SA6 tomorrow? Uh, how much How much of that sort of psychology bears down on you as a, as just as a, a human being? We, we would like for it to, to go down. Um, we, we would like for it to be gone forever. But the reality is that when... You know, we we really haven't impacted their logistical train, and um, you know, we we've really not done anything to prevent them from moving. Uh, you know, if daily for sure, if not hourly. Uh, the bottom line is, if we're able to hit a radar with the harm, odds are, in this case, they're probably going to have it repaired and replaced within. You know, it will it will depend, but call it six hours to a day, but they'll they'll probably have it back mm. 
if it's if it's just the harm hitting it. Tell us about some some of your memorable combat experiences. Then, what, what's what's the one mission that stands uh, well, out? Well, I'll tell you about the one that I was just alluding. Yeah, I'll tell you about the one I was just alluding to. The uh, we were down in the we called it the Kez, and, and again, all, all the Kosovo engagement zone. So we're down down south, and uh, we were you were always supposed to have uh, at least a flight of of Block Fifties uh, on station there. Uh, this was nighttime. And uh, I had the four ship, and RJ gave us uh, a, a heads up and then a uh, a uh, data link for a radar that was that was uh, in Montenegro providing um, data to the Serbs, and so through whatever means they had they had verified us and and we got the word that you know we want you to go try and kill this thing so i have my three and four who were down south closer to it start going that way to look and see if they can find it uh if we can find it with with our systems and then uh i i did some coordinating because we were going to be leaving the the kez uh, tell them, okay, we're going to have to shut it down because the CJs are going to be leaving, which they did. And everyone, everyone else who had been working in there went back to the north, got out of the Kez. Uh, and then a, uh, a flight of two CGs, two Block 40s, uh, who was being led by a friend of mine uh, who I'd been in Korea with. He jumped in, had kind of heard what was going on and said, you know, hey, do you mind if we essentially tag along, you know, we'll go in and take a look too, if we can see it. And you have some things you have to remember too, at the time, uh, the block 50 guys, we, we didn't have NVGs yet. Uh, so we don't, we don't have the gogs. The block 40 guys did, and this will come into play as uh Sikkim is, uh, is his call sign. who's leading the block forties. Uh, he's got the gogs and pretty good essay on us. And I, told him where my three and four were and that he should go ahead and, uh, and follow the trail with them, which he did. Uh, I finished closing the cast and then I got in the trail with him. So we had two, two and two. Uh, my number three got in there, verified that the, the site was still up. Um, Sikkim wasn't quite in position to, uh, to employ yet. So I just told number three to just hang out, stand by. Uh, cause he was ready to shoot it. Finally got into where Sikkim was in a position where he could employ pretty quickly once he had us in where the site was. Uh, so we got in, I was able to, to find it, shoot it with the harm. And he, through the NVGs could pick up the, the missile. Um, you know, he's, he's basically watching the, the, uh, the trail, if you will, from the missile and he watched it all the way to the ground, saw it function and was able, because he had eyes on it, just slew his targeting pod right there, picked it up and then rolled in and put two GBU twelves on it. <laughs> and that was a, a pretty, pretty good sortie. Um, good debrief when we got back. And uh, the only downside to the whole thing was he forgot to get his tapes on to, uh, to film it. <laughs> so, but that was good, just all around coordination, you know, went through. Um, and and we had actually, because we wound up being all U.S., we did actually push to secure comms. And that was the other part I think that helped was they couldn't listen in and, and figure out what we were doing. So we were able to prosecute and employ successfully in that case. It worked out well. What sort of percentage of your missions went well then? I mean, that sounds like a strange question, but uh, it was a challenging conflict. It, it, it was different in terms of the visibility and the results that there were in 1991 in, in Desert Storm. It was different geographically. It was a, There was a different set of operators, SAM operators. My understanding is that the Serbian IADS was... was you know, some of it was underground. So you had underground command centers, there were landlines, linking sites, you had ROE that restricted you from being able to shoot things, some of the radar sites in case there was some collateral damage and civilian casualties that came out of that. So it was different. I'm wondering, 
if you when you go back and you look at the sort of 2020 review of of these sorts of things and you read all the things that didn't go that well i'm wondering if you were feeling that at the time were you looking at what was going on and thinking you know we're, we're not making the progress we want to we feel constrained what what sort of mood was there in in your in your school only, you know only in the sense that for for me at least uh was just that we were playing catch up because when we started the whole thing we hadn't we hadn't been smart about like i say targeting the iads to begin with so that was an area where you know we we were doing a lot of a lot of juking and jiving for them shooting back uh, when we feel like maybe we wouldn't have had to do so much if we'd have been smart at the beginning and and made uh, the iads a priority and that may be true it may not i don't you know it's just 2020 hindsight but uh, that was that was probably the only um you know negative mood if you will uh for for what we were doing what we were having to deal with but it was a uh you know really more of a just okay uh, you know this is this is the way it is got it press what sort of uh mission was typical for you then would would you go out typically with the pre-planned target was it all dynamic how reliant on on the harm targeting sensor were you to find stuff rather than to precisely locate it knowing roughly where it was to begin with it would depend on whether we were supporting a strike package um and in that case you know we we typically were we were going in um uh, uh, a fair ways out in front of the strikers trying to see if there were you know either any bad guys or or sims that were up and then resetting into our caps uh as the strikers went in and and it was you know we were there we were just dedicated to helping protect the the strike package. If it was a Kez mission down in the south, then we primarily were there just to help defend um, you know a tens that were working down there. Uh, in fact, I, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, the a ten that got hit by the man pad and wound up having to divert out to the south. And those guys did a, a great job. And that was you know while we were in there. Um, and, uh, they had just wound up down low and, you know, in a position where man pack could get up and, and get them. Um, but, uh, that was, that was where we were there to essentially sit and look and try to find bad guys to shoot at. Did they come on air a lot then? Um, you, you already said that the Spang guys had told you by the time you arrived, you know, uh, uh, a few not well not far into the 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 conflict that they weren't keeping their radars on all the time i read that they wouldn't keep them on for more than 20 seconds i don't know if that's true um but where were, were they easy to locate did you how many shots did you fire at them and what sort of results do you think you got uh me personally i think i shot seven um and uh the the only one that i know of that was uh you know that worked was the one i just told you about um and uh, and I say it worked, you know that that actually hit what I was shooting at. Uh, the others, to my knowledge, were pure suppression, um, and uh, I, I don't know if they were effective or not. All I can all I can say is nobody nobody got shot uh, yeah. while I was employing, um, shot at, but not not hit. So you you like to think that it was at least in some part to, you know, the harm shot and then knowing, uh, at least having fairly good essay on the capabilities and knowing that they couldn't just stay on air. Did they do similar thing to, uh, you know, the North Vietnamese in, in the Southeast Asian air war where SAMs were used as a method to force aircraft down into AAA range. And then, you know, man pads may have actually existed at the end of that conflict, but they weren't, mainstream but but was that the technique they well they certainly were aware they were you know they were ready for that uh we did have um particularly at night some sorties where if if you wound up down you know sub twenty thousand, uh you were you know you were you were definitely um they were ready to go with the triple a and and they went went to town with it 
several times, uh, not effectively, fortunately, but they were certainly looking for that. I, I don't think that they were necessarily trying to make that happen um, as a as a tactic. It was more them being ready, understanding that if someone did wind up uh, down where the AAA could get them, they were they were ready to pounce. I, I can't remember if it was. Um, I don't remember if this was in um, Allied Force or if it was part of Deny Flight or any of the previous operations that went on uh, leading up to that uh, to Allied Force in 1999. But um, Goldfine, he was shot down, wasn't he? He was. Was he mm. shot down by AAA? That was Allied Force. Yeah, that was Allied Force. Okay. Was so was uh, he down by an SA three or AAA? No, I think it was a three. Was a three. I won't swear to that, um, but but yeah, we we actually had. Some of our guys were on station during that and helped uh, get the the CSAR going, you know, and start the cap. Um, in fact, there's I think there's a lot of that. That's actually because it was all open comms. Uh, there's at least one website that you can go to that has a ton of Allied Force comm. You can just sit and listen to, and that that's one of them uh, that I've heard was them okay. executing that that. Uh, Sarcap. I have heard of the the Dutch spotters. Um, is is it um, have quick that jumps frequency but doesn't encrypt? I, I, I don't know if that's the one. The one that where they they Correct. they obviously had these radios set up that recording all the frequencies and they just piece them all together. I think you know two or three days after the transmissions have been made, you could go yeah. and, and download. Well, them. we weren't for the most part. We weren't using have quick, so they didn't. They wouldn't have had to. They wouldn't even have to have done that. All right. Yeah, so, they were just all they'd have to do is have their you know their radio up. They could get our frequencies so, so i i suppose the question i was going to ask really around the sa3 um was whether it felt like a real threat i mean you know if it shot someone down and it you know it's it's a surface to a missile but but it's an old system presumably fairly well understood maybe exploited and you've got a self-protection jammer on the airplane you can see it uh, hope you know presumably through the harm targeting system and have some idea as to how far away it is from you and you know are you within reach of its um um you know sort of engagement zone uh, did you feel like um you know, this was a a worthy opponent. Was there? You know, you always. I know you always respect the person you're going up against, and that could probably be no truer than when your life is on the line. But did you, you know, from a, an academic point of view, look at it and think, well, you know, these are serious systems, and yeah, you know, we've got to be very careful. Could you afford to be a, compl- a complacent in any way? Uh, no, and and I'll, I'll give you another another story for what was my closest call in. In that uh, in that conflict uh, was we're supporting a strike package. It's at dusk, so it's just the the light was perfect for them, not so much for me. Um, and one of the things with the the uh, SA three radar, it's just a, it's a dirty beam. So when when it lights you up, you know anybody that's in a given piece of sky is is probably having to react to it. So. Um, I'm reacting to it and and maneuvering and I and I cannot find it. I just can't I can't see it. Um, so I'm reacting purely off of the raw and like I said, I just can't find it. And uh, on a pole down towards the ground, uh, I'm looking up through the canopy and I just see this gray shape go right up past me behind and as i i roll back right side up and start to look back up and behind me i see smoke ring where the where the sam had exploded where it had functioned wow. so that was if if you can't see it it makes it sporty and i you know it doesn't matter what it is it'll ruin your day so i was i was very respectful of the sa3 did, did you have um you you did carry the self protection jammer, but did you did you have that set in an automatic mode? I mean, do you do you trust those sorts of systems? Because I suppose you can go to red flag and you can you know do certain things and and see you know in this, in, a, in a controlled environment whether or not something works. But for real, do you go out there thinking, yeah, I trust this, I'm confident in it? You trust that it'll help, uh, but you don't rely on it by any means. It's you know, it, it's a, the combination of that maneuvering, 
chaff. Uh, hopefully you've got some uh, jamming assets, you know, maybe somebody else can get a harm in the air. All those things together is, is what you're relying on, but certainly not just, not just uh, the one, one piece to get you out of a jam. No pun intended. So this might, this might sound like a strange question flash, but I mean it sincerely, obviously there's the, the moniker, you've got to be shitting me that is associated with the wild weasels. And that of course comes from the reaction when people were first told you're going to be going and baiting these things so we can locate them and kill them. You're doing this as a, a fighter pilot, um, in peacetime, probably having a great time, living a great life. Is there a moment when you arrive in theatre and you realise that actually you're going to be doing it for real? Where you, 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 you—I don't want to say question your choice of, of career, um, but where there is a, a sort of some maybe some terror that creeps in, or or a sense of foreboding that, that actually you, you know tomorrow you're going to go and fly against this, these things for real, and you could get shot down, you could get killed. Now, you know, I, from my experience and, and all the guys that I fly with, you know, everybody that the fangs start coming out and, and you, you just, you're looking for that. You know, it's, it's the, you're going out wanting to, to pick a fight. You want something to happen. Um, and the only, and again, this is just me personally, the only time, you know, I, I had any, uh, not doubts, but just, uh, when I would go to bed, you know, that morning or that night then it was, you know, it, it was, uh, the thought of, all right, if, if I get shot down and wind up in bad guy country, uh, you know, what am I going to do if I get, if I get caught, you know, how's this, how's this going to go down? Um, you know, and eventually cause you're, it's been a long day and you're so tired, you wind up going to sleep. And it, as soon as you wake up the next day, it's right back to, you're just, mission focused and all that's forgotten mm. so i i think I, I again i can't speak for everyone but generally I, I believe most guys are just raring to go and wanting to 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 have a fight instead of just sit and drone yeah you mentioned at the beginning that um, I think it was day two the the F sixteen and the F fifteen C's got a couple of MiG twenty nines and then there was a an F sixteen AM I think the yeah, that, that got a just rebel something like that I can't remember exactly what it was so if you're Belgian or Dutch or whoever it was then for, forgive me for getting it wrong but um, and you've talked about force project uh, force protection as being your mission. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you have any opportunities to engage or pursue any um, Yugoslav Air Force fighters? Did you did you get any trade in that regard? I did. Um, it, another, uh, actually, a, a daytime sortie uh, in the Kez, and there were a couple of A-10s that they were defending for SA-6s, uh, and I wound up shooting both my arms, um, and the A-10s had gotten out of what we what we assumed to be that that uh, threat ring of where the six was um and as we we were up towards the north part of the kosovo engagement zone and turned around and pointed south uh i wound up picking up a a, a contact low just right next to pristina cloudy day and the uh, i didn't know what the bases were but the tops were uh you know 14,000 13 14,000 something like that um, and I, I pick up this radar contact and think, well, I know it's, I know it's not the A 10s, so I'm going to go ahead and lock him up and just see what kind of information I see. And he was doing about 380 knots, uh, headed pretty much due East, uh, and down low at what was probably something like five to 500, a thousand feet above the ground. Uh, and so you know, based on the airspeed, I know it's not an A-10 and there's no other fast movers that are going to be down there because it's just us and those guys. Uh, so the uh, short story longer, I tried to get Magic, who was the NATO AWACS, to give me a declaration on this guy. Uh, and, and they're working hard, but they just, you know, the, the capability for where they were um, wasn't there. And uh, 
So their first declaration was me, was my position. <laughs> I had to tell them, you know, I think at this point, no, you know, from that position on my nose, 20 miles. And, you know, he's doing almost 400 knots headed east, just trying to get them to, you know, hey, if, if you can look there, if you can see him, give me give me the declaration and I'm I'm ready to go. Um, and and they just weren't able. So uh, we didn't have any 15 C's that were able to. Uh, I don't know if there were not any uh, airborne at that point or if they were just too far away to be able to, to come and take a look. But the bottom line is I put my nose down, hoping to maybe pick this guy up through the clouds um, and just, just couldn't see him just too, too thick of a cloud cover. So I got within and, and I put my number two's radar in there as well, just to make sure, you know, Hey, I'm not, this isn't some kind of radar issue or chaff or saying he sees the same thing, exactly the same spot. And the bottom line is uh, we got to where I was uncomfortable with how far above the the top of the clouds we were so that if there was a sand bush, um, I, you know, I didn't want to get schwack. So we just told Magic, hey, this is this is where he is. This is where he's headed. Uh, if somebody can pick him up, you know, good luck. And we, we wound up having to let him go. But that was, you know, master arm on, thumb over the pickle button ready to send an amram his way uh and fast forward to the to the following day because of course we we go back and we debrief and and the intel guys get all this uh, information and our intel guy the next day found me and said you know hey uh, a mig 21 um was you know <laughs> yeah uh it, it was a fish bed so that that was uh you know they were trying to save their assets and uh had wound up running out east and going across the line so wow lucky guy this close yeah <laughs> what was your what was your you know we did have one of our guys get a kill as well uh one of the guys that was that was uh, deployed from shaw wound up killing a mig 29 so well, that was was that in the two seater was that fig uh no it? this was uh uh dog gatesy okay. um and uh he was leading the four ship of cjs and uh wound up the uh and i'll try to you know make this the not not a short story longer but uh they were on their way to the tanker uh magic calls and says essentially we have a bogey uh that's behind you and dog said well you, you know we got strikers that are on their way out and, and they were the last ones that would have crossed the border but decided they have enough gas to at least turn around and go look and because they were in a four ship number three was behind him but when they turn around do the 180 threes in front and uh haji was number three's call sign very sharp uh he wound up turning 90 out to let dog get back up in front and then re set himself in the in what would be a standard formation as number three uh anyway they get their radars in there they find this guy who's doing anywhere from about uh 450 to 500 knots just sitting there spinning and we have every piece of the puzzle as far as the id matrix except for the the positive enemy uh and i, I don't remember exactly what the range was um but uh relatively close and dog wound up getting a, a mig 29 spike on the nose and that was good enough for him so i'm um, hammering down so he wound up shooting two amrams and uh wound up getting a kill and uh i think i had i was either mission planning overnight or i'd flown that night but uh i was hearing the the uh when they called in on the radio on their way back that uh you know they were we we would tell our weapons expenditures so that when the jets got back they were ready to go with harms or whatever was appropriate in this case you know two amrams expended and uh, all of a sudden, I wasn't tired anymore, and I waited <laughs> till they showed up and got in. So uh, I was one of the first to to watch the tapes and see the whole deal. You know, it's it's awesome, very cool. Did they do um, a lot of that sort of stuff then, in terms of trying to lure you into a sand trap, sand bush? I think that that was the case, and this is our our intel folks 
best guess and, and some of the digging that uh, guys in his foreship did later on. Uh, but we think that it was one of the squadron commanders of one of these fighter squadrons that was basically, you know, the, the guys didn't want to fly and rightly so, I, I would say smart on their part. Uh, and it, essentially he was going, hey, I'll go up and, you know, show you that we can. And I don't know if he, he was going to, he's going to try to shoot somebody down or if it was a, you know, I'm just trying to show the fellows that, we can we can still get airborne and, and maybe do something for hmm. Slobodan. I don't know, but uh, that was that was what what those guys found out, and I don't know how accurate it is, but that was the that was what what we wound up hmm. finding out. It, it was a it was a seventy eight day conflict. You can definitely tell I did my research because I know that. Um, but it was it was so it wasn't too long. Um, what was your what were your takeaways from it at the end then? So you've already said that uh, at the time you were thinking they should have gone after the IADs to begin with. There should have been a concerted, um, coordinated plan to do that. Um, I suppose I, I'd split the question into two. What would you have done? Um, or maybe do it the other way around. What, what were your thoughts at the end of it when you were getting ready to go home? Did you feel like it had been a success? And what would you specifically have done differently? Uh, yeah, you know, if I was a king for a day and, and was able to say, here's, here's the game plan going in, yeah, absolutely. You know, we would, we would, uh, do our best to take down the IADs, destroy their airfields, you know, get rid of as much of their capability to fight back as we could, their ability to communicate, resupply, et cetera. Um, and the, you know, and, and you're saying as far as the, the feeling at the, at the end of it, how we thought we did or, or the end result, I would say was, uh, really that occurred later. You know, we left just knowing that, okay, it's, it's over. They've, you know, they've given up or, um, you know, we are no longer needed, but later on, as we wound up with troops in Kosovo or the, you know, the UN did with the peacekeeping piece, and finding out uh, to even greater degree what had been going on, and the fact that we had helped stop that, help prevent that uh, uh, that genocide, was was a good feeling. Was part of what helped us say, "Yeah, we were absolutely happy to be there. Glad we could help put that to an end." Mm. Did it feel one of the things that is a theme as as part of this series on the wild weasels is the air forces? Um, I suppose that they sort of, you know, the EC-130 uh, stayed, the tri electronic combat triad, the EC-130 stayed, the uh, F4G went, the EF-111 went, um, and the Air Force sort of outsourced electronic warfare, let's say, to the Navy. It was happy for the Navy to pick that up. And I think, you know, Harm was a Navy project until the Air Force saw it and got interested in it and decided to get involved and spend some money on it. But, but did it feel to you as part of, that community that the air force was sort of divesting itself of an electronic warfare capability that did you did you look back at what had happened in 91 and what had happened in 99 and thought that's a backward step was there any introspection in your community around what the air force was doing one of the things that uh, it was a push for quite a while uh and from guys who were a lot smarter than i was was the um the investment in the electronic protection side of the house, um, we had uh, at the very least plateaued and we were just sort of keep, keeping the status quo, not really trying to advance or do a better job with our capabilities of self-protection. Um, and that, that really didn't change until just right before I retired. We, you know, that there was a concerted effort to, as we saw what our adversary countries were doing and had done both with their anti-air uh, weapons and their own self-protection capability, I think we started finally getting serious about investing some money into the capability to be able to at least be on par, if not better, uh, ideally. But it was it was a long time where we really 
we didn't do a whole lot for our own self-protection. Mm. What about, I didn't ask, um, but I, again, you know, my research led me to this, is that the use of um, toad decoys, I think toad, toad decoys might have been first used in, in um, uh, Allied Force. I keep on saying deny flight, but Allied Force. Um, is that part of EP? Is that a... a component of that or is that a is that a different thing um what is what is no, that, that's, that that's certainly part of it you know and it's that whole piece that uh they talk about is not just what you have on your jet but uh what other assets do you have out there to to help protect you you know you want to have it all you will idea like somebody that can jam their frequencies both uh calm as well as their their radars shoot the harms at them you know, defend yourself with chaff, with a ECM pod. Uh, you know, those are all pieces of the, the self-protection component. Did anybody ever talk to you about cyber warfare? Was that a thing at the time? I, I remember reading in a British newspaper that one of the first instances of, of that was in 1990 when uh, an agent infected part of the Iraqi IADs with a virus of some description that activated when the mm -hmm. war kicked off in January '91, the, the following January, um, so 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 the idea of doing that and, and impregnating a, a, a computer system that's running air defense systems with a virus or or some malware of some description is is not new. Uh, but was that something that is that? I mean, as as a combat pilot, as a wild weasel, is that something that people ever talk to you about? Are you briefed in on those sorts of aspects? No, that was. Uh, if it was being talked about or considered, we, we certainly didn't know anything about it. Okay. But presumably it would I think be, it's a great idea. It would be part of your EP uh, capability as a nation, wouldn't it? That you uh, could, absolutely. You yeah, know. absolutely. So, so afterwards, um, you went to, did you go to Masawa? Is that what you went to afterwards? No, uh, no, I went to, I went to Osan from Osan. Shaw. Okay. Yeah. So I wound up going and flying block forties there and, in Korea, and then after that Korea assignment, I went to uh, Canon, where I also flew Block 40s. Okay. What, what is the rationale behind that then? So in terms of moving you from – so Block 40s was – I don't know if it still is, but that at the time I think was a dedicated night attack variant. Uh, had the, the lantern pod, had the wild field, wide mm. field of view hard, um, that capability. Right. Um What's the rationale behind getting somebody who's just spent all this time flying CJs and then going and putting them in a Block 40 CM? What's the deal? I, I think their, yeah, their, their rationale was, uh, you know, commanders may have wanted to do that, but uh, as far as the Air Force manpower assignment system, it was purely you're an F-16 coded guy. We, you know, here's where we need you. Um, and when you got to the point that, you know, later on after Allied Force was over, we did do our NVG upgrade at Shaw and, and wound up uh, getting spun up on that. So especially as an instructor, a lot of what they were looking for as well was, you know, hey, you're instructor pilot, you're NVG qualified. You know, there's uh, I had to go to the Lantern course um, at, uh, at Luke before I went to Osan. But, you know, I think that was two weeks, maybe, I don't remember. It wasn't, wasn't a whole lot. Um, but, uh, just enough to go, okay, here's, it, it's another sensor, you know, here's how to run the targeting pod. And, uh, and at the time that we were still using the, uh, the, the nav pod, uh, so you could have the IR display up there in the hood, but that was becoming redundant with the, with the MBG. So I got to Osan and, and, uh, we weren't even running with the, I don't think we were running with the, the nav pod at all that makes uh, sense i read, I so read. Uh, that that to get back to the original question yeah they're just a you are a f-16 guy uh and they they didn't have it broken down into block 30 40 50 it was just here's here's where we need a warm body at a given base did you feel like though you were a wild weasel did you feel like okay so the airplane's the same but the mission's different the weapons are different the sense is different uh -huh. We were, you know, we, uh, uh, the F-16 guys, um, you know, e even at Masawa where they put the, the WW on their tails, uh, none of us really consider ourselves wild weasels. We, we did do the, uh, you know, you got to be shitting me patch 
um, first in, last out. But uh, so we we certainly took pride in that force protection aspect of the mission. Uh, but uh, I don't think any of us consider ourselves wild weasels. You know, we were do, we were the CJ guys. Um, so not not quite the same, similar, but not the same as the weasels. So I'm going to make an assumption you're sort of a type A personality as a, as a fighter pilot, but is is that in deference to the wild weasels or is that not in deference, but and not a mark of disrespect, but because you were different? I think it was mainly we, we do, you know, if not the same mission, very similar mission, uh, but it, it's our, it's our own thing. It's a different platform, different sensors, different capabilities, single seat. Um, I, I don't think anyone would want to say, Hey, we, we could do exactly the same mission, the same way as the weasels did. You know, we were different. Um, and I think a lot of guys took pride in, in being labeled a CJ guy. Oh, you're a CJ guy, a block 50 guy. And, you know, going to a red flag or doing allied force, you know, that was a, a uh, I think a moniker that we appreciated and liked to have as the, as the force protection guys. Mm. I asked you before we hit record about some of the, the cultural aspects of the transition from the F4G to the F16CJ. And given that this interview is supposed to cover that, do you have a view on whether there was friction between the communities? Was there uh, a, a smooth handover from WW to CJ? Um, what what did you see? What did you observe? What 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 is your sense? I think that uh, I, you know I, I wasn't there at the at the no kidding transition like they had when they were flying uh, pairs at uh, Spangdalen, for instance, um, and the like I say the the couple of guys that I knew that that had been bears were just happy to help give their two cents and uh, throw whatever essay they had our direction, uh, but their you know their platform worked differently than than ours did and the ability for a guy to sit, you know, just dedicated in the back seat, kind of like a prowler or growler, um, is quite a bit different in its employment than a guy who's single seat and, you know, trying to prioritize the information that's been given to him and obviously work with, you know, either his wingman or, you know, the other three jets that, that he's with and obviously, you know, continue to provide that, whatever information is relevant to the strike package. Mm. So it's just, a, it's a different setup. And um, I, I think from, from what I saw, there was no friction other than maybe in the bar. If, you know, if there was a CJ guy who called himself a weasel, you know, that's when the, you know, the real weasel guys might call bullshit. <laughs> and I think probably rightly so. So you you would end up going on, as you said right at the beginning, you go and fly the Block Thirty again with the Alabama Air National Guard, and you got I think four four thousand hours or so. You you said nine hundred hours of combat seems like a lot of time to me. I don't know if that's unusual. Is that was that typical for somebody who did twenty two uh, years or whatever? You know, over the last couple of decades, I, I, there's a lot of guys who are north of a thousand for their combat hours. A lot of the uh, Strike Eagle guys, especially in the earlier days of Afghanistan that were driving so far from our, from the bases that we were flying out of, um, you know, they wound up with, I uh, like to say at least north of a thousand and, and probably quite a bit more, uh, long time on station. So it really, if you look around, there are a lot of guys and, and I say this, I'm painting with a, a broad brush, but there are a lot of guys who, if they stayed in the, in the airplane, like I did, I didn't go off to do school and staff and that kind of thing. Um, wound up with quite a few deployments to Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera. Uh, OIF, you know, that all, and, and all those deployments add up. Mm. So, so I'll ask a, 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 a very um, cheesy question. Of all the variants you flew, and maybe the mission types that you flew, what was your favorite? And why? Uh, uh, you know the um, 
I, I enjoyed flying the Block 50, and I enjoyed that mission. Um, I especially enjoyed it in training, just because you know, at a red flag, for instance, you end up doing, you know, you were, you were shooting arms, you were uh, mixing it up with the bad guys, you know, air to air wise, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and going back to the Block 30, I don't know how familiar you are with with its capabilities right now, but uh, we were one of, if not the first, to get the center display unit. Uh, that replaced the center console, uh, at, you know, of the round dials in the F-16. Mm-hmm. So we got an eight and a half by 11 size display. And the beauty of that was that we could take, um, you know, we could build whatever we wanted in, in those, uh, in that computer, in that display. And now with the advanced targeting pods, you know, that have uh, very high quality uh, imagery, now we had a display that could actually utilize that. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was, uh, when we went to Afghanistan uh, back in 2014, uh, sort of the, along the lines of the, the pride in the mission, that was one that I really was, was uh, happy to be a part of just because we were dedicated close air support. And a lot of times we would just hung, hang out in a particular area of the country while operations in various areas on the ground were happening and be ready for a troops in contact or a request to, hey, we need air overhead. And we would haul ass to wherever that was and be ready to employ. In fact, my first, my first mission <clears throat> in country with the unit we were taken over with, we were doing, you familiar with yo-yo ops, mm. split to the tanker, yo-yo, you're on your own. So, uh, the lead who was their squadron commander went to get gas from the tanker. I'm over near the Pakistan border and they tell me, Hey, stand by for uh stand by to copy nine line. And they had a, a guy who was lobbing mortars on them from a, basically a little, a little mountain right next to the border and needed me to go in and strafe. So I wound up shooting the gun on my first sortie. Um, so that was, there was, that was very satisfying. That was a uh, that was a good deployment. We we dropped a lot of bombs and uh, and shot the gun quite a bit. I think over eighteen thousand rounds, and um, you know that's very satisfying to be there to nook and help out the the good guys on the ground. When you spent that many years and that many hours in the aeroplane, then you're heading towards the end of your career. So you, I think you said twenty sixteen was when you got out. Um, so so you're you know you're sort of. 20 or so years in um, to your, your Air Force career and um, you've been flying the F-16, did you say since 96? 90... Uh, I went to FTU in 95. In 95, okay. So you're, you're 20 years into flying yep. the F-16. Are you at a point where you do this without even thinking about it? I mean, do, how much thought do you actually need to spend to fly an F-16 when you've got f- approaching 4,000 hours in it? To, to physically fly the jet? Yeah. Not much. To to employ, you're still you're you better be on the ball all the time. And there's a lot going on with deconfliction of where are the good guys, and I'm talking close air support specifically now. Where are the good guys? Where are my run in uh, safe run in directions, smart run in directions? You know, if you're over by the border, you're pretty limited because mm. uh, we don't want to cross the border, for instance. Um, you know, how can I do this, kill the bad guy or stop him from shooting at the good guys, you know, and obviously not hurt the good guys. And if there's other assets in there as well, uh, AC 130s, A 10s, um, you know, drones, you name it, then you have to make sure the deconfliction is there with them as well. So you're, you're thinking quite a bit. Can I ask flash just as we sort of draw to a close here, can I, can I ask more broadly, about what you are seeing in terms of the training pipeline, guys and girls coming out of the B course. Um, and I know, so you were, you were with the Alabama Air National Guard, you weren't part of the active duty anymore. So maybe you didn't have too much exposure to this, but but maybe what the sort of bro network was saying about it. And I'm sort of mindful of the the tragic case of the, of I think his name was Mez. I can't remember his call sign. He was killed um, a couple of years ago. Maybe he was asked to do... It was a wild weasel guy. I think he was out of shore, um, and he was asked to do a, a, 
the first time he'd flown the mission and he had to go and do an, an air refueling for the first time and yeah. it was at night yeah. and the, the situation he was put in. Um, and maybe that's a, an outlier in terms of the extre- extremes of, of the training pipeline and what it's producing. But were you seeing or, or, or are you hearing about um, you know, concerns around the quality of people coming through the pipeline uh, reliance on synthetic training versus real real flying you know somebody with four thousand hours you've probably got a view on the importance of of actually being in the airplane and and not being at one g and zero knots but what what are your observations on that um it, it uh here's my you know my uh my canned answer it depends um because you would get guys who and, and it's it's a great question because there's not really a, a good, uh, just a short answer for it, but, uh, you would get guys who did great in pilot training and generally speaking, they would do well in the jet. Uh, but there were some who, once you got into the tactical aspect of, of flying the jet, they, they struggled. Um, and there were a couple cases of that. In fact, uh, some of the fakes who you would think would have great SA, um, who had been, you know, obviously flying a, a training jet for a while, but who could handle the flying piece of the airplane. Once they got to the, the tactical aspect of it and employing it, uh, not all of them, but but several of them struggled. Um, you know, we had, uh, I didn't have as much exposure to, uh, females flying with us as, as a lot of guys do now, but, uh, we had our, our first female at Shaw wound up coming to our squadron. And when our squad commander first announced that he was actively going to try to get the first female, uh, you'd have liked to have been a flying on the wall in the room because we all erupted in the, ah, that's bullshit. What do you know? We don't want that. And, um, great guy, smart. He just, he waited for a second. All right, hold on a second. Let me tell you what I'm thinking or, you know, what, what the reason is. Well, it turned out, you know, he, he knew all the guys at Luke and had called them at these various squadrons because they have a, you know, they have their, their draft list of, of the incoming lieutenants. And so he's just doing his still due diligence and, and asking the question. And so all these instructors that he knew in the squadron uh, that uh, shotgun is her, her call sign, her second call sign, but uh, said, you know, this, this girl, by the way, shit hot, just sharp as they come. And uh, so he kind of started doing, all right, <laughs> we can, and this is what he's explaining to us. We can go after this female who by all accounts is going to be, at least as strong as any of you in here uh, and do great and integrate well with the squadron, just be one of the fighter pilots, or we can wait and just get whatever comes down the pipe. And, you know, maybe she's great. Maybe she's not. And that's going to be interesting. Certainly at the time when, you know, we were, this, this was all this integration was just starting to happen. So, uh, you know, again, short story longer, um, she shows up and she was a touchdown. Mm. And uh, so that was good for all of us too, because, you know, back to the original question, you had that thought of, you know, okay, now we got, uh, and, and this is in our, in our vernacular, you know, we got chicks coming down the, the, the pike and we're going to have to deal with them, work with them, you know, tiptoe around on eggshells in the squadron and, and, you know, with, shotgun certainly and and i'm sure with other uh shit hot female fighter pilots that's not true at all uh, in fact they get pissed off if you try to make an exception and say you know hey guys let me ha- and girls let me have your attention you know that she was the first one to stand up and say that's bullshit because i'm one of the guys hmm. and so anyway the you know that that's just one example of the uh the different folks that are are showing up from training and from the FTU now and and we've had uh, at the guard specifically where we get to pick who we're going to send to pilot training uh, we've had folks that were top notch and everything on paper and you know we're basing a lot of this just on letters of recommendation who knows them you know how they've done in sports and school etc came back and 
were outstanding. And then we've had others that just struggled all the way through every program and, and, uh, you know, would finally get to us. And within a year, maybe two, we'd have to send them somewhere else, you know, go drive a heavy somewhere and just didn't, didn't work out. So it's a very long answer to your short question. Do, do you but think it, it, it does depend and everybody's different. Do, do you think that's a, a reflection on the Air Force spending less money on training or deprioritizing certain aspects of training then? So, because I guess you're always gonna you're you're always gonna get people who will slip through the net. There'll always be, um, you know. I remember somebody, right. an old Vietnam guy, telling me about a guy who turned up at his F four unit at Seymour, and he said to the squadron boss, he said, "I'm telling you, this guy's going to kill someone within a year if we don't get rid of him." And and within six months, he'd flown into the mountainside, killing himself and the and the and the whizzer. Um So that I guess yeah. that kind of stuff always happens, but. Um, is is there more generally from you know because what i hear and it's the same with the eagle guys i hear the eagle guys saying well you know we're not going to teach this on the b course anymore we're not going to do every fueling we you know we haven't we haven't covered this part of the syllabus so the load is carried by the operational squadron um when the new the new pilot arrives or the you know, new wizard if it's an f-15e squadron um and i just wonder if that's right. that's something that's just happening air force wide if that's just a, a defocus on aspects of training or spending money on it uh, I, I, I have heard that they're going to try to go to more Sims in pilot training. And, and I guess they have the VR stuff now. And I, I just don't know how effective that's going to be. Um, cause ultimately you're, you're always going to get your best learning from actually putting all your gear on, going to get in an airplane and flying or flying in relation to another airplane you know, having all the environmental effects that come along with that, um, you know, whether it's the G's, where the sun is, uh, there's a ton of different inputs and environmental factors that uh, are, you just can't replicate in a sim. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know something like air refueling, if if a sim is going to be, and maybe the fidelity is there now. Um, It wasn't when I left, but it, it could be better now. Uh, to be pulling up to the boom, have it bouncing around, you know, see the wings and the motors bouncing and and still trying to work your way in there, be able to judge that closure rate where the, you know, stopping at the appropriate position on, on the boom. And I'm getting into uber detail here, but, uh, you know, the point being that if that's, for instance, something that they're trying to take out of their courses and maybe replicate with, with uh, a sim or uh, or VR, I think is a mistake, you know. But we we seem to go through this this sine wave uh, of we gotta we gotta get people through. We we got too many sorties, not enough money. Mm. Um, you know what are we gonna do? And then when you do put it on the operational unit, it just obviously adds to to their uh, training load and. You know, somebody somebody's got to teach them at some point. They obviously got to go do it, especially in an operational fighter squadron. Thanks for tuning in to Ten Percent True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.